psychologist from Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, we're going to have um, just discuss some of the issues that have been uh, brought front and center here at this uh, global meeting, global conference here, relative to global health. And as we know, cardiovascular mortality is the number one killer of um, everybody around the world. It is an equal opportunity disease and is uh, rampant and uh, unfortunately continuing to uh, increase in, in prevalence and incidence as well. So maybe we'll start off with just this whole issue of global burden of disease. Uh, and uh, as you all know, there was a, a recent series of articles in Jack describing the global burden in various regions around the, the world, um, drawing distinctions, but also drawing similarities. So maybe we'll just go through the panel. Bill, what, what should, uh, how should we be thinking about cardiovascular disease as a global disease, a global problem? Well, <clears throat> thanks for the opportunity. I mean, it really is an amazing issue that we have to deal with. If we think about the United States, Cancer and cardiovascular disease are almost neck and neck, so we can tout our, uh, our successes. However, if you look at it globally, and Daniel Pinheiro probably would know even more, is that cardiovascular disease is by far, by far, the major uh, issue of morbidity as well as mortality. And, and I'll share with you that this is an issue not of discovery of drugs and therapeutics, but of healthcare systems and what's available for the population at large. There may be some educational opportunities for the various populations to know about their risk and whether they should do something about it. There may be access to healthcare. There may be a workforce issues because I know it is very disparate throughout the world. And uh, I know we will talk about workforce issues, but it doesn't have to be the physicians only providing some of the care, particularly for things like hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, et cetera, et cetera. So we recognize this is a major issue for the population at large throughout the world. Still an issue for us here, but it is certainly magnified so much on a global level. That's a fantastic over overview. Danielle, you have a bird's eye view to uh, these issues globally. Um, expand a little bit upon um, how are we going to tackle the issue of the, this increasing global burden of cardiovascular disease? Is it a, a top-down uh, issue, or do we, have to, do we have to concentrate on the more fundamental causes of disease and tackle them from a preventive standpoint? First of all, thank you for the opportunity to join American College of Cardiology in this very nice uh, work together, ACC and, and uh, World Health Federation. Uh, the, the, the point of the, the, the global burden of cardiovascular disease is that it is not just a problem for, for rich countries. It's a problem for, for middle and low income countries. It's a problem for men and for women. And it's a problem of uh, development because if you, in some way, the burden of cardiovascular disease and in general, non-communicable disease, is the burden to the, the, economy, to the economy of uh, low and middle income countries. And these countries have to, to in the front, Communicable and non-communicable disease at the same time. So we have to, to, to face two challenges at the same time. Communicable disease and non-communicable disease. So for us, from the point of view of uh, World Health Federation, it's very important prevention. It's very important diagnosis and it's very important access and affordability of treatment because it's a chronic disease. And uh, I think there is room for uh, interchange our different experiences in different rooms, let's say in poor countries, middle income, different system of health. So 
I think we can improve that. I think I'm very glad today being in a session of clinical trials in some works in implementation. Mm -hmm. and I, I, there was, a, let's say 40 years ago, this, this type of, 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 of topics will be in a very small room in the, the fourth floor. And now they are in the main tent. Main tent. So uh, we realized that we need to intervene this, uh, this, uh, this problem, not only from the point of view of physicians, but from the point of view of citizens, of advocates of our, of our community. That's it. That's, that's, a, that's great perspective. KK, as chair of the uh, Assembly of International Governors, you um, interact with leaders in different countries all over the world. And although I think we're seeing a harmonization of the um, sort of the basic fund of knowledge around disease, treatment, therapeutics, devices, uh, as that becomes more uniform and standard across the world, but it seems like one of the differences is how we implement at the local level. Can you talk a little bit about how is, what's the conversation within the, uh, uh, the AIG around sort of sharing best practices with respect to implementation of some of these great things that we have, as well as the issues around prevention? Thank you very much, um, and appreciate the opportunity to be in this uh, stage with you. Um, so the AIG consists of essentially um, is the ACC extension to, uh, to international uh, countries around the globe, and we have 42 chapters. So if your country is not yet a chapter, you can still join us. Uh, but beyond that, you can also join specific initiative by the AIG. And essentially, we look at non communicable disease uh, importantly, and we are, in fact, uh, targeting that. So there are many ways of doing that. Um, there is a lot of education which we are pushing. Uh, the NCD Academy is one, one way where you know, we go into primary care physician and ask them basically education, ask them to go through... Uh, this uh, educational series. So with all this communicable disease, if you're hitting them at the prevention level, you know, reducing diabetes, obesity, and all that, I think it does help eventually to reduce the global burden. But the burden is huge, and um, we, we need to read the Jack article to appreciate that. And uh, it's divided into regions as well, so it's very uh, useful, an article uh, issue in Jack. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think we need to probably attack it in all fronts. And Danielle was saying, you know, provide accessibility as well for those who are symptomatic for MI patient, you know. Uh, you need to provide them with uh, top state-of-the-art uh, therapy. And there lies the problem in lower and middle income country where um, therapy may be qu quite expensive and may not be uh, in terms of cost effectiveness to, to do that. But having said that, I think if you, you know, look at this lipidemia, the use of statins uh, in, in terms of prevention of uh, reducing cardiovascular burden, even that is not fully um, employed in, in around the globe. So we, we need to push for low-lying fruit um, and hopefully uh, improve the cardiovascular burden. Well, I think the, the beauty of the AIG is that nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And so if you can bring together, you know, 42 sets of good ideas, uh, that's going to be very productive. Dipti, clearly innovation is going to be absolutely necessary uh, to help solve these problems. We tend to think of innovation always as being sort of high tech, you know, shiny object. But you in particular have championed some of the benefits of, uh, of frugal innovation. Can you speak 
the logically savvy field. Um, but if you think about our, our waiting rooms in that same period of time, we really haven't changed the way that we deliver care. And so I think fundamentally, whereas you know industries like finance, transportation, banking have really uh, you know embraced digital transformation, we do a lot of innovative things in our practice, but we really don't haven't changed the way we deliver care. And I think if we can change the delivery of care, and we found out through the COVID pandemic that we needed to reach our most vulnerable patients. And how did we do that? Well, we pivoted overnight to telehealth, so telemedicine. But I think one of the things we learned is this much more than telehealth. We need not only a platform to be able to communicate with the patient, but we probably need some virtual remote patient monitoring so we have data so we can make more informed decisions, create therapeutic pathways. We need to switch from the health to really a healthcare model rather than the sick care model that we've been doing. So when you talk about frugal innovation, that's exactly right. We all think that digital transformation means all these technologically advancing, but it's not. It's the change of the delivery of care and how we do that. And that can be done, and there's been a lot of projects done uh, in India for frugal innovation where they've taken um, community workers and either done um, centers where people can come and get some care through remote patient monitoring because they have a capacity issue. They don't have as many cardiologists. Um, they also have these same community workers have a backpack and a bag that has uh, uh, not only a, um, a camera, but a digital stethoscope and all of the patient, remote patient monitors so they can go to homes where they need to and they have a van that can do all of that. And that has been proof of concept that these things can work. And those communities have better adherence to medications, had better control of hypertension and diabetes. So trying to go to that burden of the risk factor profile that's causing the, ultimately this burden of cardiovascular disease. I, I think you bring up an excellent point that actually the um, high income countries are going to learn how to solve their problems with healthcare delivery from the low to middle income countries. I think, I think we need to keep our eyes open and learn from our colleagues. Um, Bill, you are, um, you are an educator, you're a researcher, but you're also a, philanthrop a philanthropist. That's hard to say, but you're a philanthropist. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, in reverse order, I think everybody should recognize, and you'll hear more about this at the meeting and, and certainly see uh, more coming in the, in the next weeks or, or so. Bill has very generously established the William Zogby Global Research Fund. And this will be a very important vehicle to help, uh, help us establish the necessary research and leadership development uh, to tackle these problems. So maybe in a more, uh, no pun intended, global way, talk about a little bit of the need for research in, in this particular field and also developing the leaders who are going to not only lead the research but lead the implementation. Well, thank you for the opportunity and let me tell you, it's an honor to partner with the college in, in such a mission to identify talent and support investigators and thought leaders in their countries. Um, I've personally been involved in the international mission of the college for at least 15 years or so. And having traveled the globe and talked to many uh, people who are interested in such a field, you know what the need is. And the need is many of these thought leaders, emerging leaders in the countries, wherever they are, particularly who have less opportunity, low to middle income countries. And uh, I was in a um, conference call, a Zoom call, with many of these young investigators trying to identify opportunities for them to do the work in their own country. Because realistically, many of these investigators may not be able to go to Europe, may not be able to come to the United States where they can learn many things, but at the same time, there are needs in the particular country uh, to support these individuals. So what I planted is a seed. And hopefully you can partner with the college to grow the seed into a big tree from maybe one award to even five awards in a few years. 
And I think we have to partner all together with industry and all the supporters and you as individuals who believe in this uh, because there are so many ways to advance knowledge and innovate. It's not only in bringing people to where the research, high-end research is because many of these uh, innovations are local and uh, they, they may not seem that we're inventing a new way of treating a disease, but to answer a question that is very pertinent to the community where they can impact healthcare and outcome at the local level. Yeah. Well, I, I think this is an, a great example of uh, how can we impact uh, you know, global, global health moving forward, not just uh, during our time of service in the, in the college, but how do we establish these legacies to uh, help sustain it and, and grow the next generation and keep people involved. Danielle, you know, we have, uh, I know one of your um, specific interests and, and uh, missions in, in your tenure as president of WHF is around advocacy and global advocacy. Can you talk a little bit about what are the opportunities for advocacy and how do we, how do we conduct advocacy at both a local and global level? Thank you. Thank you for the question. <laughs> uh, first of all, we, we, we must recognize that there, there is no advocacy without the background of science. So we, we cannot make advocacy for, for anything. We have to know the science that is the background of our advocacy. Second point is that we as cardiologists, and I said that yesterday. We as cardiologists are privileged people in our community. Mm -hmm. Actually myself, I'm a privileged because my, my grandparents were immigrants from Spain, very poor people, and, I, and uh, my father couldn't finish the, the, the university, and I finished being a doctor and I'm now with all of you, so I'm very proud. And I think if my father was alive, he will be very proud too. So in, in any place we are, we can make advocacy because we have to advocate for our patients, for our professions, for our mission. Obviously, there are other levels, let's say, any society, any uh, foundation, any group of patients in a country, in a region, in a, in a community can make advocacy, let's say. And we, as World Health Federation, we have the mission to, have, to make advocacy at the level of World Health, Organi World Health Organization. So I think advocacy is everywhere. And the, the second point I, I want to take, if you allow me to, to come back, uh, our main aim now is the universal health coverage. That is the main aim for us. And I think, as Dipti said, that digital, digital health would be a, a very important tool for make this to be a reality, let's say. And from the point of view of the young people, uh, I, I'm seeing a lady there that is one of our emerging leaders. We have the very nice program of emerging leaders for the last uh, 10 years, uh, gathering a group of more than 200 uh, young people that now they are not the future. They are the, the, our reality today. So I think it's room for all. We have to, to, be, to be very proactive because advocacy is to be proactive for that. And we, we are very confident in young people. Well, that is a great segue to a question for KK. Um, so KK, uh, across the college internationally, Danielle has has raised the, uh, the importance of engagement of the young people 
in terms of um, you know not only being engaged in the college but being engaged in the um, the the advocacy efforts of the college as well as the educational efforts of the college. How, give us an idea of what uh, what is available to international uh, members uh, from getting involved early on in the college and what are their opportunities going forward within the chapters. Thanks very much. Uh, I, I think this is very important. I mean, the FITs and uh, early careers, we, we really want to groom them forward. So, um, in terms of membership, I think the ACC make a special sort of uh, provision for those below 40 uh, to have complimentary uh, membership uh, with the ACC. So that's great. Anyone, medical students, residency, uh, FITs below 40 can join the um, ACC from international um, in, for free. And then within that, you have access to all the educational materials, including the 10 Jack journals. So those are educational sources, resources that uh, the young people can learn to move forward. Um, beyond that, uh, we also um, try to help the early career as well as uh, mid-career cardiologists. So we do have uh, for early career um, and mid-career, we do have leadership forum and as well as uh, other, you know, virtual access to, to meetings and uh, webinars for them to, to learn. Thanks. The key is to get engaged, though. The key yeah, is to, is right. to yeah. jump in. And I will just say, you know, uh, um, that's been a real challenge during the pandemic. We saw that in, in many circumstances, fellows in training or people who were going to go into cardiology training got held back as primary frontline healthcare workers during the pandemic. And we've sort of missed two, three years of a generation entering into cardiology, so we have to sort of jumpstart that again. This is, a, this is a workforce issue, essentially, and I know, Dipti, you have been very engaged in um, sort of the, the general issues related to workforce. Workforce is very closely tied to issues of burnout and burden. What, what things should we be thinking about or uh, talking about at a global level, you are uh, you are now going to be a board member of the WHF. What is your advice to the WHF going to be around how we tackle some of these workforce issues? Well, first, I think just really being able to acknowledge that there is a workforce issue and that it involves the whole cardiovascular team. It's the cardiologists. It's our team members. And then sort of doing a, you know, a little bit of an analysis as to what is a, a playing into that. Obviously, the COVID pandemic with the burnout issue has been a big issue, but there are lots of other issues. You know, I think the world has changed a little bit. People want more flexible hours. People want, uh, in terms of the uh, younger cardiologists, they, they, they're doing longer training with more debt when they finish. So maybe we need to rethink the way we do train our workforce. Um, I think that we learned to pivot in a lot of different ways during the pandemic to accommodate. We allowed people to, you know, uh, we were flexible in a lot of the things that we did. We may need to shift to some of those things and adopt them. Look at, uh, we started to discharge patients over, you know, after PCI at a much higher rate. Uh, we started to utilize more remote patient monitoring. So we need to start to incorporate some of these things to make our jobs less burdensome at some level so that therefore there would be less burnout um, we need to think about how can we encourage younger people. So how, what are some of the pipeline programs we can do for nurses, for physicians, and what, what is it, what is it going to take for that? So we're going to have to reapproach. We're going to have to approach this in a sort of a different way, not say that I did it this way, so that means the next person is going to have to do it this way. Right. So, Bill, you have the broadest perspective here of anybody related to the, to the college. What do you think? think, what would your advice to the new leadership as, as we go, we are in this transition here at this meeting, as we pass the baton on to the next team, 
what, what is your advice uh, to, to those of us and, and to those uh, coming on board in terms of how we prioritize global health, how we incorporate that into the, uh, the overall mission, vision, and values of the college? Well, um, number one, I'm so excited to see the attendance at this meeting. Um, it is back to pre-COVID levels. <laughs> and uh, it also tells you, uh, interacting with many people, how excited they are to talk and connect a network and share science, share all the developments. So thinking globally and thinking futuristically as to what we need to do, I mean, I mean that, that could be a full day of discussion, but I'm just thinking out loud and what is important. One, recognizing that science is very exciting. It is changing, so much changing at multiple levels. Things that we cannot do ourselves as humans by incorporating machine learning, AI, other things, it will facilitate as opposed to eliminate yeah. our positions as physicians, technologists, sonographers, healthcare professionals, uh, applied health. Uh, it will make our job easier, provided that we don't forget who are we trying to help, right. which is the patient and the patient perspective. Two is the burden is enormous. Yes, we made amazing impact on cardiovascular disease over the past 40 years. We made it probably a little more in uh, developed countries as opposed to middle and low income countries. But I think we have to tailor the needs and the applicability and the advances and how to provide the care in the low to middle income countries a bit differently than we do it here. It complements our approaches. And third is, is to think about our workforce. And the workforce, again, is to excite people into the field because there are tremendous opportunities and impact. If you think about many areas in, cardio, in medicine in general, just think about the power of prevention to be able to prevent disease. Many other areas in medicine, you really truly cannot prevent the disease per se. So we have tremendous opportunities for us to do that. And we have to think about the total workforce, uh, our applied health individuals who can work with the physician team, all of us as a team, to be able to provide the care wherever is necessary. And, uh, you know, to entice people that this is an amazing cause, an amazing mission globally. And I think what you see, the partnership here between the ACC and, and the World Heart uh, Federation uh, tells you about, number one, that we can work together, and number two, that it is truly a global mission. Fantastic. Well, I think with that, we are at time, and I'd like to thank our panelists uh, way too short of a period of time for us to discuss these important topics and uh, really look forward 